Hi everyone, welcome back to English 388 Postcolonial Studies. In this video, I'm going to give you some context for the novel Heart of Darkness and specifically to talk about the history of what's known as the Berlin Conference or this quote scramble for Africa and the emergence of the Belgian controlled Congo Free State. So this is going to be some important historical contextual information as to why Joseph Conrad wrote Heart of Darkness in the way that he did, and also to help you understand what's going on in the novel. Now, as a content notification, I want you to know that some of what I'm going to be showing you here on this video and also in the slides um, are images of pretty serious repression and brutality against Congolese people. So um, just kind of be aware of that. You know, if you need to pause and look away, that's fine. Um, but I think that we should be forced to look at these images because this is the history that we need to learn and kind of hold on to as we move forward thinking about you know, where the Democratic Republic of Congo is today and why it might be that way. So the first thing, and I'm going to pull up the slides and I'm going to screen share. The first thing I want to talk about here um, is the Berlin Conference. The Berlin Conference took place in 1884, 1884 to 1885, and it took place between 13 European nations and the United States. And these nations were primarily, you know, England, France, Belgium, Germany, Portugal, Netherlands. Um, but most of Western Europe gets in on this conference. They gather in Germany to formally partition Africa. Uh, and the reason this matters is because there were already you know, prominent colonies, um, European colonies in Africa. But there's a, an, a, an emerging need on the part of European colonizers to kind of establish that, to claim which, with each other, to agree, you know, to partition Africa such that um, there would not be interference between and competition between colonies. So you can imagine quite literally people getting together in a room, putting out a map and deciding you know, who gets what, where are the borders, how is this going to uh, work out for Europe. No you know, African people were consulted in the partitioning of the African continent. Um, it's also important to note that several of the borders of modern day post-colonial African nations are linked to this partitioning from 1884-1885, and those borders were arbitrary in the sense that they don't necessarily reflect the existence of a particular um, ethnic group that understood itself to be something like a nation state, right? These are arbitrary borders that were only recognized by the European colonizers. So in the post-colonial period, as we'll discuss later in the semester, this creates a whole series of difficulties um, around what does it mean to be a nation when the construction of the nation and these particular borders was entirely imagined, um, not only by Europeans, but for European interests. One of the things that emerged from the conference was what was called the Berlin Act. And this really formalized what is often referred to as the scramble for Africa by establishing the following, so the following rules, okay? Um, the principle of effective occupation. This meant that colonial powers had to take possession and occupy the colony militarily and administratively in order for it to be recognized as belonging to that European nation. So if you were France, say, you couldn't just go plant a flag and say, oh yeah, that colony belongs to us because, you know, the Netherlands might want to show up and claim that part of Africa for themselves. So there was an understanding that if you say that you have colonized that part of the continent, you need to demonstrate that by taking possession of it in this way. This is really important, especially for the context of Heart of Darkness and what will happen with the, what we call the Belgian Congo. Free trade between European colonies and shared use of the Niger and Congo rivers. Okay, so we have a very early idea of free trade, globalization, and you know, the imperialism, um, the, the aspect of imperialism in the Congo is not just about, or, or not just Congo, but all of Africa, is not just about enriching individual nations. It's also going to be about private companies that can establish um, themselves as traders and trade kind of between different, um, different countries. So it really is a kind of a privatization of wealth and the globalization of the extraction of resources from a very early period. Okay, this is interesting. One of the aspects of the Berlin Conference was that they resolved to abolish slavery in the Berlin Act. And this was pretty, um, I would say this is kind of manipulative. Slavery was still going on in um, parts of Africa, 
the thing is, is that especially in Belgian Congo, the, the rule of King Leopold II in Belgian Congo, you know, really exacerbated and made ample use of slave labor, child slave labor, slave labor, slave labor altogether. Um, so this idea that the Europeans were colonizing Africa in order to abolish slavery was a pretty dubious claim. It was a PR claim, if anything, um, to kind of put Europeans on this kind of you know, right side of history, this being this moral beacon that would show up and civilize Africans that were colonizing and, uh, or sorry, that were enslaving each other. Um, of course, this was not what the Europeans did. It's certainly not what the Belgians did. So that's an important thing though to note. This was the, the line at the time. So by 1902, you know, within less than um, you know, 20 years of this conference, 90% of Africa was under colonial control. And by 1914, this is on the cusp of World War II, the colonization of the continent was almost was complete with the exception of Ethiopia and Liberia. I'm going to show you a couple maps now. So here is 1880. This is what um, a map of Africa in 1880. Okay, take a look at this more carefully in the slides when you pull those up on your own time. And here's what Africa looks like in 1913. Again, if you look at it carefully through the on the slides that I post, you will see you know the, the color coding and which parts of Africa have been carved up by which parts of Europe. In the very middle here, we have in purple, Belgium. But you know, primarily we're looking at colonization of Africa by the UK here in this kind of coral pink color and by France in blue. Okay, so now I wanna say something about the Congo Free State, which was established in 1885. Don't let the word free state uh, fool you. By free here, they were, they're referring to free trade, okay? It becomes a, a, a space, a kind of free trade zone, we might say, in today's parlance. The Congo Free State, which is present day Democratic Republic of Congo, existed between 1885 and 1908. And Belgian colonization of Congo was, you know, took place for decades after that, but I'll say more about that in a minute. This was the private land holding of King Leopold II of Belgium. Um, he claimed to be engaged in charity work, setting up International Association of Congo to run this part of Africa, you know, the, the kind of idea of sending Christian missionaries. Um, but, but really what was going on was the extraction of resources and the use of slave labor. The free state created a free trade zone in which there was no tax for trade for private corporations to extract resources, just basically set up their own, um, set up their own corporation, you know, set up their own company. These resources were primarily rubber, ivory, and minerals. Um, we're gonna see a lot about ivory in Heart of Darkness, but rubber was one of the, the most important resources that was being um, extracted. And importantly, even though it was the private land holding of the King of Belgium, the free state was open to entrepreneurs of all European nations. So it really was a free for all. People from all over Europe, well, entrepreneurs from all over Europe, were there to exploit and get rich. Importantly, no laws govern the private activities of corporations in the free state. So there was no oversight, right? It really, it was a free for all. No one could really be blamed because it wasn't just one particular country committing these atrocities. So as a result, you know, these corporations could rely on slave labor, torture, et cetera, and no one really ever said anything about it until 1904. The next slides I'm going to show you are very difficult to look at. So this is my content notification for you, but you know, I think it's important that we see some of these images. Between 1885 and 1908, half of the native population of the Belgian Free State died as a result of Belgian rule. Think about that. I mean, it's estimated to be between 10 and 20 million people. This is genocide on the scale of, well, beyond the Holocaust. You know, I mean, it's, it's unimaginable. You know, the, the total devastation and atrocities and death committed in the Belgian Free State. Uh, and yet we don't really talk about it today, certainly not in the United States, um, and it's still being kind of reckoned with in Belgium. And I've posted some links about that on Blackboard if you're interested in that. 
Um, and most importantly, this summer, there were some statues of King Leopold that finally came down and were brought down in Belgium. So in, in the you know, late 1800s, beginning the 1900s, it wasn't exactly that no one knew that these atrocities were going on. And it wasn't exactly that no one cared. And I, I think this is important to remember. Often when we look back at terrible things that happen in history, whether that be slavery in the United States or genocide of Native Americans or genocide in other parts of the world like Congo, there's a tendency sometimes to say, well, yes, this was terrible, but people didn't really know it was wrong back then or they didn't really see it that way. And that's, that's not true, <laughs> okay? P plenty of people figured out what was going on in Congo and were ab adamantly opposed to it. In 1904, the Casement Report emerged. This was a report led by a British diplomat that brought attention to the atrocities going on in the Belgian Free State, brought international attention to it. And it's important that it's also a British diplomat, you know, so this is going to be significant for how Conrad positions himself and his critique of Belgian imperialism um, when we get to Heart of Darkness. As a result of this Caseman report, which included you know, documentation of atrocities, images like the ones you're seeing here of dismemberment, amputation, King Leopold was pressured to turn over his free state, his free trade zone, his free for all state, we could say, to the Belgian government in 1908. So the Democratic Republic of Congo did not emerge in 1908. Um, we don't have the end of colonization in 1908. Simply, there is more oversight, right? And, and Belgium has to kind of be accountable to what's happening in Congo as a result of the casement report. Belgium held on to Congo until independence in 1960. And um, it's a very complicated history after that with a series of civil wars. The country was um, changed its name to Zaire and then now Democratic Republic of Congo and has changed borders several times. Um, but we, don't, we won't get into that for the moment right now. I'm gonna show you some uh, more difficult images now. So here are just, you know, some images taken from reports about what was happening in Congo at the time. Not, you know, kind of like slavery, actual slavery. And especially with the, um, the use of slavery for rubber plantations. Now you see here an image of a young person without a hand. One of the reasons for that was that people would be punished for not extracting enough rubber, for not harvesting enough rubber. Um, and it's, it's, I don't know how much detail I want to go into it here. Suffice to say that if one did not produce enough rubber, they were, people were supposed to be executed. The force publique the essentially um, the you know, military, the police uh, th that were enforcing labor's labor code, if you could call it that, in Belgian colonies, uh, were supposed to execute people who did not produce enough rubber. As a result of that, um, they were supposed to demonstrate that they had murdered someone by cutting off the hand. So we can think about hands being cut off as kind of maybe the equivalent of scalps in the West and in, in America. Um, this was a symbol or a, a signifier that someone had been killed. Now, sometimes the Force Publique did not bother to kill people. They, I mean, they absolutely did that as well, but sometimes they just severed and amputated people's hands. So, you know, on the one hand, the severed hands represent murder. On the other hand, sometimes they were just severing the hands and people sometimes survived. So you had a whole generation of Congolese people who were without limbs. And this was something, this, this image of amputation and severing hands was something that the Casement Report really brought to light and became um, kind of something that was symbolic of the larger you know, atrocities and brutality in Belgian Congo. Here's another you know, difficult image here in the, the report, we're told that the severed hand here and foot is that of this man's five-year-old daughter. Again, this done as punishment for not producing enough rubber. 
Now, as a result of these horrific images and this report, people in Belgium and throughout Europe became increasingly critical of what was going on in Belgian colony in the free state. And here is a political cartoon from the time. So here it says, in the rubber coils, and the snake here is actually King Leopold, there's his face, you know, and he is strangling this person. And it says at the bottom, seen in the Congo free state, right? So drawing attention to the hypocrisy that in the so-called free state, the free trade state, there is slavery going on and genocide. Heart of Darkness was written in this context. Heart of Darkness was written in 1899. So actually five years before the case met report. Heart of Darkness kind of comes into being as a text because the author, Joseph Conrad, had captain a steamboat, a Belgian steamboat, down the Congo River in the 1880s. He kept a diary and he wrote Heart of Darkness a decade later um, as he was reflecting on his experiences there. Conrad is, um, a, let's, let's say he's an ambivalent figure in the history of anti-colonialism. Now he's born in 1857 in what is today Ukraine of Polish parents. Um, and he leaves Poland, becomes a sailor in France and then in England and is a member of the merchant navy. His Polishness, and I'm giving you his, his name here, Josef Konrad Nalicz Kozniowski, his Polishness matters, I think, um, for those of you who are interested. At this time, when Joseph Conrad was growing up, Poland was not an independent nation. It was essentially colonized by different European powers, but especially in the part that he was living in by Russia, by the Tsarist Empire. And his parents were very active in the movement um, to free Poland from dominance and control by Tsarist Russia, and were involved in a series of uprisings. Um, his father did, Conrad's father did time in jail as a result of being involved in these uprisings. So in some ways, as a Polish person living in Western Europe, Conrad already has a kind of critique of imperialism, perhaps. A critique of the idea that one powerful nation should come to dominate another part of the world. But his critique is pretty limited. And this is something we need to be attuned to as we read Heart of Darkness and something that Chinua Achebe is really gonna help us think through when we read his, um, his piece next week. Because on the one hand, Conrad in 1899, when he publishes Heart of Darkness as a three-part series in this magazine called um, Blackwood's Magazine, on the one hand, he is engaged in helping to expose what's going on in Belgian Congo, the atrocities of it. But on the other hand, he's sort of using this position as of his narrator, who is a British person, an English person, to distance himself and create a dichotomy between you know, good imperialism of the British versus the bad imperialism of the Belgians. So we need to kind of be mindful of that as we read this text. And when I, in the next video, when I talk more about the text directly, I will say more about that, about these moments of ambivalence. I will also say that it's important to remember that Joseph Conrad was not fluent in English until his 20s. So when he writes Heart of Darkness, he's absolutely writing this text as you know, a non-native English speaker. And some have attributed that to kind of the uniqueness of the language. It is a very um, dense and rich text, sometimes you know, putting things in ways that seem almost strange to the ear in English, but also extremely precise and revealing. And so the fact of, of him not being a native English speaker here maybe allows for something in the English language to emerge. Um, in fact, people have been so taken by the language of Heart of Darkness and have been so kind of drawn into the, the richness of the language of the captivatingness of the narrative that sometimes that has led at least English scholars to ignore some of the really you know, less, um, less positive aspects of the text, including the point of view that Conrad offers, which is primarily the point of view of the colonizer. Okay, that's for the next video, but here I hope that this overview of 
the context for Heart of Darkness um, is helpful for you as you begin to read. And also take a look at the links I've posted. I've posted some things about um, some history links, so things on Encyclopedia Britannica. Um, I've posted some articles about you know, kind of the legacy of King Leopold and how people are reflecting on it today, and also very contemporary events, including this past summer with efforts to bring down statues of King Leopold in Belgium and statues that continue to exist to him in in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Okay, I'm gonna save those other slides for the next video. I'll join you in a moment there.